You ever just sit around and just stare at bait? Sometimes I do that. And I really like staring at these old pikey minnows. Just something about these old baits is so cool to me. Like I love all these awesome musky baits that are out on the market right now. There are some incredible baits out there and I wish I owned more of them, but I don't know, something about these old minnows. Like this bait is so cool. I could just stare at that bait all day. And I can't help but wonder what it would look like if I tried to make one. That would be really cool. I'd have to use a lathe. My dad owns a lathe. I don't own one. I could slip over to my dad's house and try and lathe uh, one of these out. It would be a fun experience. I would definitely want it through wired because I wouldn't want this type of hardware in one of my baits. Even though I think that's part of what makes these baits cool. You know, if I was going to make this, it would just be a normal through wire job. An aluminum lip, that's in just shaping it like that. That would definitely be something I've never tried to tackle before. I don't know how I would even go about it. Like, I'm not a metal guy. I'm a woodworker. Like, metal is so foreign to me. I got two of these shorter lips and then two of these longer lips. Actually, three of the longer lips. This one's actually in really good shape. This one doesn't look that old. The hardware is still nice and silvery. And then I got this jointed vamp. That's pretty cool. I wonder how they do that face. Like, is that just carved out by hand? You know, if somebody did somebody sit there and with like a little knife in their hand and carve that out, or is that is that machine? Is that like sanded? I don't know. External hardware. That's pretty cool. I would love to do an external hardware bait and then just put some really nice shiny or even blacked out hardware on it. I think that would look really sick. That could like really complement a paint job if you just have some sick hardware attached to the outside. I think that's pretty neat. That would be fun to do too. Maybe for another day. But I'm looking at these ones. And that would be so much fun. Let's do it. Let's make this bait. So for this bait, I'm going to go with the Western Red Cedar. I have this piece of wood here. It's not very thick. It's kind of on the thin side and it's going to be cylindrical. It's going to need to be a little thicker than this. So I'm going to cut this up and glue it together. And then I'll see how thick I can get this bait. Because I think the thickness, well, that's going to determine the diameter. And then the, I think the diameter is going to determine how long I want to make it. So let's just uh, cut this up, glue it up. And tomorrow I can start thinking about getting this thing rounded over. So the block ended up being pretty square, which is nice. But before I just put this in a lathe and start turning it, I think I'm just going to kind of prepare it uh, and cut the corners off on the table saw. So I'm going to set my table saw blade at 45 degrees and then just run it over and just kind of knock off uh, all four of these corners. So I'm over at my dad's house and he's got this cabinet in his garage here. And I would bet you that this cabinet has not been opened by him in at least 10 years maybe 20. It, this thing is never opened. I've used this maybe once or twice in my entire life. Oh yeah. Look at that. An old craftsman. Let's see if I'm balanced. Not perfect, but that'll do. They just don't make these tools like they used to. This is a really cool tool. Look, this is the last time I used this tool. I kind of spun this thing around and just played around with it. Let's do this.
You know, that's that looks pretty good. I like that a lot. I think before I do anything else, I'm going to drill out the holes for the hook hangers uh, and the weight hole before I cut this thing off. It kind of gives me something to hold on to. I kind of wish that these were left square because that might have been helpful in clamping this thing down. Just kind of realizing that now. Uh, it does have a glue joint, so that's kind of nice that I at least have some kind of reference as a, for a top and bottom. Just kind of looking at the bait. That hook hanger looks like it's almost right in the middle of the front of that body. I kind of want mine to be just a little forward of that, say right about here. And the back hook hanger, we're going to put right about here, and that should be good. I don't really know how much weight I want to put in this thing, so I just put the bit that I normally use for my 7-inch baits, and uh, hopefully that'll be enough. And I'm going to try to go maybe half of the bait right to the midline. But that looks good. Alright, now I'm going to swap this bit out. And we'll do the back one. Now I think I'm just going to cut the waist off and uh, round over the nose and the tail on a sander. All right, so I'm a little proud of this one. So I was racking my brain as to how I'm gonna cut this lip slot, because I'm gonna have to do it on a bandsaw because I'm using thin aluminum for the lip. Um, I'm using 1 inch aluminum. And I've never cut a lip slot on a cylindrical bait. And it's gonna be very important that the lip slot is perfectly perpendicular to the midline of the bait. So because this was a laminated piece of wood, I have a, a glue joint here that's going to represent the top and the belly of the bait. And I used that in drilling out my weight hole and my hook hanger holes. So this is now the bottom of the bait. So that's established and this bait now has a bottom and a top. So I kind of drew my line out and I was thinking how am I going to keep this perfectly up and down into a bandsaw blade without you know any error because I, I want this to be you know dead nuts 90 degrees. So I figured as long as my drill press was straight up and down, which it is, I checked it, basically I could take a block of wood like this and drill out the holes because my drill press was still set up. So I basically just inserted these dowels and if I just insert them into the bait, now I have a square block that I can basically set down like this. And as long as this block is square, which it is, I can just hold it down and slide this right into a bandsaw blade and that should keep this perfectly perpendicular. And for the uh, you know the shaping on the top of the uh, head of the bait kind of has that little scoop. So I was going to do that on a belt sander but now that I have this little jig set up I'm actually just going to run the run this over the bandsaw as well and then just kind of clean it up on the belt sander. So this little jig is hopefully going to keep this bait perfect.
Absolutely perfect. I don't think it needs to be any deeper. I think I'll be good. I think that looks pretty good. I'm happy with that. Everything about that went great. All right. I'm scratching the jig for drilling out the eye. I'm just gonna push this up into uh, the Forstner bit, and I'm not gonna drill very far in because I don't wanna carve eye sockets on this bait. I think that would be, it would look okay, but I, th I you know, it, it would look more like one of my baits, but um, that's not what we're doing here, so. And I'm pretty sure I'm ready to cut this in half because the through wire channel uh, I need this cut in half to drill out the through wire channels and that's the next step and then I'll take some sandpaper and uh, clean this up a little bit so that's nice and smooth but I think this is ready to cut drilling this through wire uh, portion is is pretty tough because you're on, you start on such a steep angle and you're kind of drilling into an angle which you know you can get your your drill bit to walk a little bit it can be kind of a pain in the butt so I always use a brad point bit and I'll start drilling kind of at a really really steep angle and then once I get like my hole established a little bit I'll start to you know angle it towards where I'm actually headed and uh, then I'll just kind of start punching through. And then I'm going to widen that to 3 16th. That's good. Just as this one should be really easy because I'm going straight through the center, as centered as I can be. That'll do. And because this is a jointed bait, I'm gonna basically countersink a little hole around this through wire channel, um, so that way I can bury a loop into the back of the bait a little bit. That'll do. And now I'm just gonna sand these angles onto my bait. So I'm just realizing, uh, instead of having this screw be external, I want to bury that in the bait so it's just not uh, not visible. Um, so I have these little tiny stainless steel screws, and uh, I'm going to drill the pilot holes for those, and then countersink a little hole for the head of the screw to go in, and then I'm going to seal the bait. I was about to just seal it, but I just realized... I want the pilot hole and the countersink hole to also be sealed. I don't want to be drilling into the wood um, that isn't sealed and breaking that seal around the lip because I've never 
epoxied aluminum lips into wood, so I don't know how well that holds. So I really need these pins to really grab everything. So that's why I'm going with the screw for these pins. But I'm going to go ahead and figure out uh, what diameter I need it to be. And um, I'm going to just do these pilot holes real quick. All right. I'm just going to use a piece of steel as a punch. And I don't want to over drill or under drill, so I'm going to basically set the depth on this with a piece of tape. Same depth. Those look good. Perfect. I'm super excited about this bait. So I have this old book and I decided to kind of open it up to see if there was anything on the Creek Chub. And of course it's chapter number one, uh, which was pretty cool. And if you look through, the, got all of their early stuff. This book is really neat. It tells you a little bit about it and it tells you the value of it. Here's the jointed pikey minnow, the shallow, the deep diving pikey. And I just thought this was really neat to kind of flip and and then I flipped to this page, and I saw this. Giant jointed pikey minnow, 14 inches long. That That's so cool. So I went right to eBay. Here it is. So check this thing out. This thing looks like it's mint. And the fact that it came with the box is super cool. I know that kind of, uh, you know, increases its value a little bit, and I definitely paid because they uh, had this box, which really wouldn't have mattered too much to me, but it is something that's super cool to keep on the shelf. But look at this lure. This thing looks mint. And this hardware is actually surprisingly beefy. Like, if, you know, just feeling this hardware, you know, they're small little baits, and uh, I don't blame them for having you know, uh, small hardware, which, you know, it just kind of makes sense. I wouldn't musky fish with one of these baits. They're just, they just don't feel like it would really hold up. Uh, so, but, but this lure really, I, I would run this bait. Like this thing is pretty beefy. It's got a really beefy toe point and a beefy lip. This, this hanging hardware, you know, looks pretty solid and just not a scratch on this bait. This thing is neat. In 1906, three fishermen from a small town of Garrett, Indiana, joined together to produce fishing lures. The company was named after a small fish commonly used as live bait, the Creek Chub. Few would have predicted that such a small operation would develop into one of the most successful bait companies of all time. Two innovations in lure production that were refined in the early days of the Wiggler changed the entire industry. The 1919 Creek Chub received a patent for spray painting lures through netting to give it a scale finish to the bait. That's crazy. These people literally patented painting scales. Like, that's awesome. They quickly licensed several other major companies to use this technique. In 1920, the patent was obtained for the metal diving lip that made these early lures wiggle. This innovation is still being used in all crankbaits being produced today. Basically reading that, they also patented using a metal lip. Like, did, did Creek Chub invent the crankbait? If so, that's pretty wild. That's awesome.
So shaping this went a lot smoother than I was expecting. The bandsaw made short work of cutting this and I was actually able to cut a radius on the bandsaw. It just kind of went through like butter. So I, I pre used precaution and I just kept way outside the lines and just sanded it smooth. And well, it looks pretty good, at least to where I drew it. So we'll see if this lip actually works. I got this line here that is going to be my first bend. I uh, punched a couple of... Uh, holes to drill through for my through wire and then I have another line here where it's going to bend outwards so I'm probably just going to clamp this in my vise and just bend it and uh, we'll see how that goes but first I got to drill out these holes for the through wire I like that that's better Okay, well, that's a lip. The width is perfect. That looks pretty good. I don't hate it. It looks nice. This might work. Well, we'll see. And to wire up the back end, I'm just going to tie a big loop, wrap it around four or five times, and then just seat it inside of the hole in the hole. Alright, that looks pretty good. Just a pilot hole size problem. I'm just gonna drip in some West Systems epoxy until this is nice and topped off nice and slow the slower you go the better because if you get uh, if you accidentally fill up the whole hole it traps bubbles and then that's really gonna slow down your process so slow is faster and what I really like about this West Systems is that it has a really low viscosity and it just kind of wants to flow so it's really good for filling up channels
All right, after the epoxy was done, I gave it a quick sand and taped off the lips and gave it a quick primer. And I did all that off camera because that's all really boring stuff. But I got my headpiece and I got my tailpiece ready to go. So, ready for color. I haven't put a whole lot of thought into it. Maybe like brown perch. Something classic, something that you would have found on on one of the original baits. I got a couple colors set, set out that all kind of fit that mold. Let's start out with a uh, hmm, little yellow oxide. I know it says yellow, but it looks kind of like a tan. I have a feeling it's going to come out pretty yellow. And I think I'm going to keep the belly as white as I can. I, I think I want a white belly bait. That's pretty good. Next I'm going to do a little burnt sienna and I'm just going to lay that on top of this this color and uh, then my plan is to do maybe like a darker brown bars over that maybe some skinny bars. Let's see how this color looks on top of this color and then I can kind of decide on what I want to do. I like it. It's a little orangey, and that could just be because it's laying on top of a yellow, but I don't hate it. And I'm also not used to painting stuff with like sharp ridges, which is going to create like these little pools of paint. You can see that along that line there. You just got to kind of be aware of like your airflow over sharp ledges like that where your, your paint could uh, pile up. And now I have transparent brown iron oxide loaded in my airbrush. So I am going to layer this over the whole thing and maybe brown up this orange just a little bit. Yeah, that's better. I think that looks good too. And a lot of times, so for example, when I had the burnt sienna and then I had the yellow oxide on the side, any time where you want it to fade into a color and have that be seamless, to have another color, you know, maybe a transparent color is usually preferable, but just coat the whole thing in that one color and you can usually tie in those colors together. So now there really isn't a very obvious separation of where I stopped with that orange. It just kind of fades right in. All right, I think I got some good brown to make some bars. Let's start with one. One bar, it's pretty straight. Oh no, okay, slow. Started to splatter on me a little bit. My hands are super shaky right now because I'm actually just getting over COVID. 
I'm feeling like 95% better, but you know, I probably shouldn't even be outside right now, but I just feel like doing this. So my, my paint job is kind of suffering. I'm like making big, uh, I don't know if you could see that there. Just big uh, blowouts. I probably could have turned down my PSI a little bit, but we're going to just keep darkening them and expanding them until they look okay. The hardest thing for me to do in painting is to stop painting. Like, I, in my head, I always feel like, and I don't know if anybody can relate to this, it's like, add more paint to make it look better. Where, in reality, it's like, you probably should have stopped, like, 30 seconds ago. So what I'm going to do before I start to add scales and details is I'm going to take all this tape off and put a layer of top coat on the bait and uh, that way I can come back and I can use this super fine mesh and uh, not worrying about scuffing the paint because when I do these videos I don't really let my primer coat cure totally and harden. I usually let that harden overnight. I give that 24 hours before I start painting and I didn't do that on this one. So I'm going to just put a top coat on this and come back and we'll do some details tomorrow. All right, the top coat is cured. I'm going to put some scales on here. I'm going with a uh, iridescent bright gold. See how those look. All right, not bad. Not bad. So next, what I'm gonna do, I think, is gonna come back with some sapia and maybe just touch up these lines a little bit. I I was pretty sloppy with these lines. I don't hate them, but I don't love them either. So I'm gonna just touch up these lines, and uh, I think I'm good to go. Oh no, a spill. I'm really starting to like how this tailpiece is looking. Like the sapia over the gold scale, which is over other bars. I don't know. The layering is starting to look really cool. I like it. Why do I keep spilling? What is going on right now? My brush is just too full. There's no need for that much paint in this cup right now. All right, that looks pretty good. I'm happy with that, very happy with that. Time for some eyes, some top coat, and then we get to test it. I hope this thing runs. It would be such a shame if it didn't. I'm optimistic though. I think these eyes look appropriate. Let's go with these. Shout out Dead Meat Customs. What's up, Matt?
looks good. that's it for this video thanks for watching this bait turned out great I'm super excited about the action it had a really nice it was kind of like a subtle head shake it was like a quick vibrating head shake but then it also had like this serpentine action to it that I think is gonna be absolutely killer you know I'm gonna do another video maybe in the spring once I can get this out onto the boat and uh, really tweak the lip you know I know that people with the pikey minnows would would be fanatical about tweaking their lips and dialing in just like the perfect action. I'm super happy with this one right out of the box without even tweaking the lip, but I'll play around with that and um, see what kind of different actions I can get just by tweaking the lip. But, you know, the paint job turned out awesome. I'm pretty excited about it. You know, all these like little sharp edges on the bait, uh, you know, the epoxy doesn't really do very well covering those hard edges which I kind of anticipated it being uh, a little thin on those hard edges. But, you know, overall, I think the look, fit, and finish of this bait turned out phenomenal. I'm really excited about this, and that's another one for the box. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, just, and just one more thing. Um, during the making of this video, my father-in-law passed away uh, from COVID, and um, I just kind of want to dedicate this video to him. His name was Randy Ross. And um, he was one of the greatest people I've ever met. Uh, it was a, a real pleasure knowing him. And um, I had a lot of love for that man. And, uh, and he's going to be sorely missed. Um, just, a, just a fantastic human being. Um, yeah, that's really all I have to say. Miss you, Randy. Thanks for watching.